Hi, we're the Buckeye Space Launch Initiative, and this is the WOW rocket. Our project is a high-altitude sounding rocket capable of sending a 3U CubeSat payload to 30,000 feet. This student researched and developed design features a composite airframe, which transitions seamlessly to an exposed motor tube for improved aerodynamic performance. Underneath the airframe, the recovery system sits at the very top of the rocket, ready to deploy in a single separation event. Beneath this is the Integrated Systems Bay, or ISB, which houses a 3U payload and a 2U avionics bay. In this iteration of the project, the payload will study vibrational and acoustic conditions present during flight, as well as investigate past failure modes with a particular focus on 3D printed structural elements. Beneath the ISB, the body of the rocket is coupled to a 20,000 newton second SRAD motor and a Max-Q aluminum fin cam. In a full-scale flight, the rocket first enters the boost phase, where a 6.71 second long burn accelerates the vehicle to nearly 2,000 feet per second. At motor burnout, phase two begins and the rocket coasts to its final apogee of 30,500 feet. During this 36 second coast, computer and payload data will be logged and telemetry data will be sent back to ground station. Once the flight computers detect apogee, the vehicle enters phase three by deploying the drogue parachute. After descending under drogue, the main parachute is deployed at 1,300 feet above ground level. This marks the start of phase four, where the vehicle reaches a terminal velocity of about 20 feet per second and ultimately returns to the ground again. This design was not flown to its full-scale apogee of 30,500 feet due to the COVID-19 pan pandemic. However, our team was able to complete five static test burns as well as two successful test flights of about 10,000 feet with Tripoli Mid-Ohio. This year, the team and I have been working towards developing a framework for the workflow necessary to conduct computational fluid dynamic simulations in a time-efficient manner while maintaining confidence in the accuracy of our results. To do this, the team is focused on learning about the intricacies of the software used, Fluent, and documenting the decisions made during the creation of a mesh or model. Our research was split into two areas, 2D axisymmetric and 3D simulations. 2D axisymmetric simulations are great for the predictions of forces encountered by the rocket frame at any point within flight, and for comparison studies between different airframe geometries. This year, the model created is able to run in less than 10 minutes for Mach numbers ranging within the subsonic and supersonic regimes. The conditions used to describe the rocket's flight represent the conditions the rocket would experience at Max-Q at Spaceport America. At Max-Q, the team predicted the rocket would experience a drag force between 1,150 newtons and 1,250 newtons, and found that the center of pressure predicted within open rocket aligned with the location of the center of pressure found within the 2D axisymmetric simulation. The second area of the team researched was 3D simulations. The team has made great progress towards finalizing a 3D model. However, the intricacies associated with meshing techniques are still being worked out. Within the 3D simulations, the fin geometry is accounted for, thus the drag is higher and stability can be analyzed. However, the speed of the 2D simulations allows for comparisons to be made quickly if the piece of the airframe being analyzed is not the fin. The development of these models was of critical need. Now, within future semesters, design innovation can take place at a much faster rate due to the amount of documentation created and the improved accuracy of the models. The purpose of the recovery team is to assemble a system capable of deploying drogue, pilot, and main parachutes at the desired altitudes so that the rocket does not drift far from the launch site and is not damaged while landing. The recovery system consists of all components located to the right of the rightmost bulkhead as seen on the screen. On the bulkhead sits two nylon 3D printed ejection charge canisters sealed using cellulose and tape and an eye bolt. An epoxied hole drilled through the bulkhead allows for wires from the avionic system to make their way to the right of the bulkhead without compromising the airtight fit needed where the bulkhead meets the body tube. Before the shock cord is attached to the bulkhead eye bolt, a fire retardant sheet is placed over the canisters to ensure the blast does not potentially burn any of the three parachutes. The dimensions of the shock cord can be seen on the screen now. The first junction connects the main parachute bag, the recovery bulkhead, and the line separating the nose cone from the remaining airframe. The second, top junction, connects the drogue parachute to the main line and an eye bolt located within the nose cone. The deployment strategy is as follows. At Apogee, Flight Computer 1 will fire Ejection Charge 1 
which consists of five grams of black powder. Five seconds later, the second flight computer fires the second ejection charge, which contains 4.5 grams of black powder. The separation of the nose cone and the lower rocket frame extends the shock cord, opens the drogue chute, and allows for the main parachute bag to be exposed. Once the rocket reaches 900 feet, both flight computers file, fire a cable cutter charge, which holds both the pilot and main chutes within the main parachute bag. The recovery system has a single layer of redundancy as it has two completely separate flight computers. It is important to note that the confidence in the success of our ejection charge design at 30,000 feet was enforced by a paper written by community veteran Jim Jarvis. At 30,000 feet, our design ensures that there exists a necessary amount of oxygen to completely burn all the black powder very quickly within each charge. This year's rocket features a transitioning design with a 6-inch body tube, which transitions to a 4-inch motor tube. The body tube and nose cone are made from carbon fiber, and the transition piece is made of fiberglass to allow RF signals to pass through it. Both the motor tube and the coupler are machined from aluminum. The rocket is just over 10 feet tall and weighs about 70 pounds on the pad. The motor tube and body tube sections are connected with a machined aluminum coupler. The motor tube and body tube are both friction fit as well as bolted into the coupler, which extends about four and a half inches into each end. The coupler also has two threaded rods mounted to it, which secure each bulkhead and the integrated systems bay in place. This also allows for the systems bay to be assembled simultaneously with other systems and outside of the rocket, making integration much easier. The transition piece acts as an aerodynamic shroud for the coupler, rather than a structural piece, as previous teams have found difficulty creating a successful structural coupler using composites. The nose cone is made of six layers of carbon fiber, with extra weight in the tip to help with stability and move the CG forward a bit. The nose cone has a friction fit into the body tube and is secured in place with shear pins. The rocket also uses five total bulkheads, one on top of the motor tube to secure it to the coupler, one on either end of the integrated systems bay, a recovery bulkhead that sits above the integrated systems bay, and a final small bulkhead which is inside the nose cone to attach to the recovery system. These bulkheads are made of the plywood core between six layers of carbon fiber. The motor tube section consists of an aluminum motor tube and an aluminum fin cam. Every part of the WOW rocket airframe, excluding the aluminum parts, was constructed by the team. The nose cone and transition piece were fabricated using a three-step layout process, which consisted of a wood plug, a fiberglass mold, and the final piece, which was vacuum formed. Both the body tube and the test motor tube were made by wrapping carbon fiber sheet around an aluminum mandrel. Each piece of the airframe is sanded and painted in order to minimize drag on the rocket. After two test launches of the rocket, every part designed for the competition vehicle was reusable and undamaged. This year, we designed and built a modular avionics system so we would have a standard that could be used in future years. Another advantage is that it allows us to update the design on certain parts without having to rebuild the entire system. The structure of the bay consists of a 2U CubeSat design. One side of the bay is the back plane, which allows for power transfer and communication between modules. For communication, we decided to use a controller area network or CAN communication scheme. CAN communication is particularly relevant to our modular design because it can have any number of nodes. The CAN protocol uses message arbitration to make sure no messages interfere with each other, and it can also do automatic error detection and correction. To enable communication on the CAN bus, each module is designed with a programmable microcontroller and a CAN transceiver chip. We designed a total of five modules. First, the power module regulates the battery voltage and supplies it to other modules over the backplane. The power module also measures the battery voltage and current, then periodically transmits the measurements on the CAN bus to the Bluetooth module. The Bluetooth module allows for communication between the avionics bay and the ground station outside the rocket. The ground station can be any Bluetooth device that can run the custom ground station Python code. For this year, we just use someone's laptop, but in the future, it could be a smaller computer, such as a Raspberry Pi with a small touchscreen. The ground station interface, shown here, allows us to send the rocket arm or disarm messages for each of the flight computers and the payload. The interface also allows us to see the state of each flight computer, along with battery information. We have two modules for arming each of the two flight computers. We use the Telemetrum and the Stratologer flight computers. When the arming module receives arm or disarm code from the CAN bus, the microcontroller activates or deactivates an optical isolator, which is in turn connected to a MOSFET, which acts as a switch for the flight computer. The optical isolation is important because each of the flight computers has its own separate battery for redundancy. The final module we worked on was the first design iteration of a custom flight computer and telemetry module. 
Although we were not able to get this module to function for this year, the initial design will be improved in the future to allow for data logging, telemetry, and eventually deployment events, all using a single custom board. The 3U CubeSat payload is designed around two experiments, a study of the vibrations and acoustics experienced by the payload and avionics during flight, and an investigation into possible failure modes for our 2018 competition rocket. These experiments are housed in a machined aluminum frame, which consists of four plates connected by rails. Each experiment attaches to these plates at the M3 through holes with custom 3D printed structures. Data recording is managed by a Teensy 3.6 development board, which acts as the primary microcontroller for the system. It is powered by a nickel metal hydride battery and writes all the data to a text file on the onboard SD card. The system is armed using the avionics CAN bus system to save power and allow for data to be recorded only during flight. However, if the payload were replaced with a boilerplate payload, this connection can be removed from the avionics board with no issue. To reach the minimum weight, steel plates can be added to the top plate and attached with threaded rods. The first experiment focuses on the vibrations and acoustics experienced within the integrated systems bay by the payload and avionics. Understanding this environment will help future payload and avionics teams understand what their designs will experience during flight. Vibrations are measured by a pair of accelerometers, with one limited measuring a range of plus or minus 2 g's of acceleration and the other to plus or minus 8 g's. Their axes are aligned to the rocket, with the y-axis pointing upwards towards the tip and the x and z axis extending radially from the sides. A Zoom H1 handy recorder records audio of the flight to an SD card, allowing for frequency analysis following the flight. Additionally, a separate Arduino Uno-based decibel meter was planned but never completed due to part delays. The second experiment studies potential failure modes of our 2018 competition rocket, with a focus on 3D printed component structural failure. The 2018 rocket never deployed its parachute and crashed into the ground, with our post-flight failure analysis revealing the most likely cause as the failure of the 3D printed PLA avionics bay. For the 3D printed component test, Strain gauges are placed on 3D printed PLA test pieces which are flown under load with any deformation recorded to the Teensy. A control piece is kept on the ground to act as a comparison for post-flight analysis and hand measurement. Additionally, a set of wires like the ones connecting our avionics bay and recovery system in the 2018 rocket are flown under load and any disconnects are recorded to the Teensy. The solid rocket motor for WOW consists of a sub-minimum diameter 98 mm by 54 inch long aluminum motor casing, which serves as the lower aerodynamic portion of the vehicle and the fin attachment location. The body coupler is bolted on to the forward closure of the motor, securing the stack to the upper section of the rocket. Using prior data, it was determined that the team could feasibly create a motor which would deliver approximately 20,000 newton seconds of total impulse with utilizing 8 grains of propellant within the desired casing. From there, the team designed and characterized a propellant consisting of magnesium fuel, a trimodal AP ratio, and strontium nitrate, aptly named Mad River Slow Red due to its scarlet exhaust color and intended burn rate. Due to issues encountered in prior years with high length to diameter ratio motors and potential loss of burning behavior, the team elected to design a propellant with slower burn characteristics. With the propellant characterized, the team utilized the Burn Sim software to generate a motor design to static test and to fly at the Spaceport America Cup competition. The design motor had an average thrust of 3,045 newtons, a total impulse of 20,191 newton seconds, an initial KN of 232 rising to 331, and a burn time of 6.6 .6 seconds. In the course of testing the propellant in a 75mm M motor, it was discovered that the scaling factor of the propellant did not follow the data characterized from the smaller 54 mm motors. This meant the M test motor burned in 3.05 seconds as opposed to the expected 4.54 seconds. Due to this and the competition being canceled, in the abundance of caution, the team elected to not conduct a static test firing of the 98 mm N motor. However, plans are in place to further develop the propellant to provide more stable results for next year. Overall, a lot of challenges were faced throughout the course of this project, particularly due to the coronavirus pandemic. Despite these difficulties, we were able to meet and exceed the goals we had set for ourselves at the beginning of the year, and we're very proud of the work we've accomplished. We are the Buckeye Space Launch Initiative. Thank you for watching.